Hey, welcome back to our Gwanda Assembly of God YouTube channel. This is message one in a new series called Proverbs, Direction for Your Bottom Line. Our start off verse today is 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, and 10. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. It's funny how fitting that verse is today, uh, just in light of the loss that we've had. But this wasn't something I planned because of that. It just, things fit when he does what he's going to do. What, the, the thing I really want to notice as we're starting off today in this verse is very simple. It says, for God has not destined us for wrath. When I was working for Pure for God Ministries... Uh, we had something we called FLQs, and that's simply you take a whiteboard or a notebook and you say, okay, we're going to look at a verse and we're going to say, here's a fact from the verse, here's a lesson I can learn from that verse, and here's a question I can ask myself from that verse. And it plays out kind of like this. <clears throat> what is a fact that this verse says? And not something you kind of can deduce from it, but something it immediately says, Okay. It says that, for God has not destined us for wrath. That us is talking about believers who have surrendered their life to Christ and are depending on him for grace to cover their sin. But it says he has not destined us for wrath. Here's my fact. There is wrath. It's just a fact. He wouldn't bring it up if it didn't exist. Now, in our world today, God's wrath is something you're likely never going to hear about if you're not looking for someone to challenge your life. Nobody wants to talk about God's wrath. There are churches that will never talk about God's wrath. And I understand why. God's wrath is not a subject that really builds attendance quickly? It just doesn't. In the same way that calculus-based physics does not build a lot of attendance really fast because it's hard. The funny thing is that the people who are in that class, which I was not, tend to be the ones that have a great amount of earning potential as they leave that class because they're willing to put in the work to learn something really hard. And our lives are similar. We're actually going to start a new series today <clears throat> called Proverbs. Can you see what that is? Yesterday, I was putting this graphic together, and uh, Grace Lawton was at our house. <clears throat> so I took this paddle that Sarah's dad made decades ago. <clears throat> if there are some dents in it, that's not from spanking children. That's from children hitting things with it. So I'm walking through the kitchen with my Bible with a paddle on it, and Grace is like, what is he doing? And Caleb's like, oh, he's probably doing something for a sermon, which I was. So there is a tagline for our, our Proverbs series, and it is tools to help your bottom line. Okay. So we are going to look into the book of Proverbs for a few weeks, and we're going to pull some things out that we can use every single day. We can use it in relationships. We can use it in work. We can use it in the way we see God, the way we see us, the way we see relationships. This is going to plug in everywhere. But I think before I do that, I kind of need to, to answer the question, why Proverbs? Why do we want to study these things that a guy wrote probably about 1,050 years B.C.? The whole book of Proverbs was pretty much compiled around actually about 950. 900 to 950 B.C. is when most of it was written by Solomon, King David's son. Okay? So what I want to do to kind of explain why it's important is I want to go to a story first to start us off. This is a picture, kind of an artist's depiction of a certain piece of a story. 
In about 649 BC, there was a little boy who became the king of Israel. And his name was Josiah. Okay? Now here's the crazy thing about Josiah. Josiah is one of the few good kings of Judah that served God with all of his heart. Now a little bit of history. The nation of Israel was all one nation, 12 tribes, when King David, about a thousand years BC, ruled right? Saul was the first king Israel ever had. When God rejected him, David became, became king, David and Goliath, all those stories. He's about 1,000 B.C. When David died, his son Solomon became king and built Israel's first temple. And in the dedication of that temple is one of the places, is where we get the scripture where it says, for if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. That scripture comes from when the temple was being dedicated and God is saying, if you will honor me and follow me and keep my commandments and and respect my laws, then there will be blessing on you. But if you don't, then there will be curses and hardship and death and famine and destruction will come on you. But even in that place, if my people who are called by my name That's where that scripture comes from, okay? God said that to the guy who wrote Proverbs, okay? So it makes sense that he would have a focus on God's commands. Now, one thing I got to say is, in the Old Testament, there were rules and laws that aren't the rules and laws today because so many of them painted a picture of what Jesus would do on the cross. So a little bit of the details have changed, but the heart of it, has never changed. And the heart of it is, what has God said about his world and my heart? And will I choose to respond to him or will I choose to run after wickedness? The Bible says our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know them? It means that our hearts, if left to themselves with no focus on God, will run after whatever pleases me. And our hearts will tell us, it's fine. It's really not a big deal. Because they're deceitful. They're kind of like a little child in what they tell their parents when they're asking for things. You know, when they get to that age, when they start to realize that there is some information in their quest that is detrimental to a proper response right? So they don't tell you everything. Like, I've never had a child come to me and say, hey, Dad, um, can I have a cookie? Mom said no. Never had that. I've never had that ever happen, right? There was a time, super funny, when we, were, when we first had uh, candy bars and stuff in the, in the store. I think it was Levi, right? So Levi was about two years old, and he's standing in, in front of the register, and it's like just shelves full of candy bars. And he says, Mom, can you go somewhere? <laughs> and suddenly it struck her. I think I may know why he said that. Yeah. <laughs> she didn't go away, so there was no yay. But... <clears throat> Nobody has to teach us to be deceitful. It comes naturally, right? Okay, so here's a story of King Josiah. About 300 years before King Josiah was born, there was an evil king. And the kings of Israel, for whatever reason, would set up altars to foreign gods, like Baal and Asherah. And they were brutal. There were times when people in the nation of Israel sacrificed their own children to false gods. And the details are unimaginable inside of that. I won't tell you all the details of it. But they would do this. And so these, these kings were setting up altars, and a prophet said, there is a king coming whose name will be Josiah. And he will tear down these altars and he will kill the false prophets and burn their bones on these altars. Now imagine somebody in, oh, say, 1718, 
prophesies that a leader will rise up by a specific name and will do a specific thing. And it happens. That's what happened in the life of Josiah. Now, I wonder if his mom and dad named him, hoping that he would be that man. But I don't think so. Because the king right before Josiah wasn't a good king. He wasn't a king who served God. He was a king who didn't. And so why would he name a son this name that had been prophesied 300 years earlier that would come and destroy all the evil things these kings had set up? So he's born. You know how old he was when he became king? He was eight. He was eight years old when he became king of Israel because his father was killed. So 18 years into Josiah's reign, which would have made him 26, one of the priests that served in, the, in that time came across a scroll that had the law. The first five books of the Bible are referred to as the Torah, and they have all of the law that was given to Moses and the people way back when they had just come out of Egypt. And one of these priests found this, and he brought it to Josiah. And they begin to read it. And this is Josiah's response. He tore his clothes. Do you want to know why he tore his clothes? Because he had never heard the law before. But he knew that the disobedience of the people had caused some problems. Let's read a couple of verses from 2 Kings chapter 22. Now this story is also in, I believe, 1 Chronicles 25 or 30, right in there. It's told in two different places. Some of the books in the Bible, like the, the two books of Kings and Chronicles, they're historical books and they overlap in detail. Sometimes one of them will give more detail and sometimes the other will, but they're talking about the same time periods. So let's check this out. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and, ah and Ahikam the son of Shaphan and Akbor the son of Micaiah, a lot of different names back then, in shop on the secretary and Isaiah the king's servant, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. Josiah understood that wrath is a real thing. And whether or not the wrath of God is applicable to your life has everything to do with whether or not you have believed what he has said and whether or not your life is conformed to what he has said. If you're going to disregard what God has said about you and his world and what's right and wrong, you are going to put yourself in a place where the wrath of God is due on your life. The New Testament, Paul's writings are littered with situations where he talks about the wrath of God stored up for the children of disobedience and, and this person and that type of person and liars and deceivers and fornicators and these people will not enter the kingdom of heaven. We are either identified by what calls down God's wrath or we're identified by what covers us and protects us from that wrath. The word Christian means little Christ. It means that you've turned over the keys to your life and said, the only thing that can pay for my sin and help me avert the wrath of God is the blood of Christ covering my life. So the wrath of God is no less real to a believer. It just doesn't apply to you anymore. But it is real. Anybody know what happened in Josiah's life? He was in a real, a real pickle of a time. The nation of Israel deserved to be destroyed, to be taken down and taken into exile in a foreign land, and it happened, but not in Josiah's time. Has anyone ever heard of Daniel? The story of Daniel in the lion's den? the story of Isaiah and Jeremiah. These guys' stories are right in the same time block. Josiah became king in about 649, and Josiah died when he was just over 40 years old. He was killed in battle. And the destruction of Israel 
followed his rule because the hearts of the people went back to their old ways. Do you know that he destroyed all the high places? He tore them down and he killed all the false prophets and he burned them on the altars. He did what had been prophesied. And God told Josiah when they inquired of the Lord that destruction was coming on the nation of Israel, but that he would live his days in peace and that that destruction would not come until he had been gathered to his fathers and was at rest. Do you know why God said that would be the case? Because when Josiah was made aware of what God's word has said, he was repentant. And he humbled himself. And he turned his attention to what God wanted. And the first thing he did is he told the priest, please pray and see what God says about our whole nation because we have incurred his wrath. Josiah had not lived an evil life. He had never sacrificed to an idol. He hadn't worshipped an idol. From the time he was a young boy, he had served the Lord with all of his heart. But he names himself. He says, we. And he doesn't see himself as faultless before God. He sees himself as guilty. And he repents for the people. And they call a fast. And they turn their hearts back to him. And God preserves that nation until after he's gone. Once Josiah's gone, the hearts of the people turn. Nebuchadnezzar rises to power in Babylon probably one of the top two or three most powerful men ever to rule on earth. Israel's taken down. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are carried away as young teens into Babylon. That whole story happens, and the prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah come true. It's a sad story, but you see the heart that God wants us to have right in the middle of it. He wants us to have a heart that when his word says something, that word that he has given us is the most important thing to consider. Josiah did not think, how do I like keep momentum going and not get anybody mad? The Baal guys are going to be really ticked when we start taking these down. So maybe we should legislate something that kind of moves in a direction and slowly... You know, we'll kind of, that's just not what he was not concerned about his own well-being. Whether or not he would be assassinated for tearing down the altars of these people who worshipped Baal and these other gods, his priority was being right before the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the creator of the world. That's not the world we live in today. Today our world revolves more around how's everybody going to feel about that than what has God actually said. I want to go back to the opening verse real quick. For we are not appointed unto wrath because we've given a way of escape from it. But wrath has not gone away. It didn't disappear when Jesus died on the cross. In fact, it got worse. Because before the cross, you were rejecting the law that God had given to man to govern us on this earth. After the cross, to reject what God has said is to say, your son was murdered and ripped apart for everything I deserve, and I don't care. That's like going into court, having committed a serious crime, and then spitting in the face of the judge. It's actually worse now, unless your life belongs to him. When your life belongs to him, there is so much right there at your disposal. I mean, there's so much life to be had here in peace and direction. He says, get in the yoke with me. Pull along with me. 
My yoke is easy and my burden is light. You'll find rest for your soul. The word talks about a peace that passes all understanding. Paul talks about coming to a place where in his life he can be content no matter where he is, with much or little, in sickness and in health, in prison and in freedom. And he says, I can do that because of Christ who strengthens me. Who wouldn't want to live in that place? The problem is the, pay, the, the cost of living there is high. He's, he's only asking for everything, for all that you are. So let's look at Proverbs 1, 5 to 7 real quick. This, we're not just entering the sermon, so I want to put your mind at ease. Okay, That wasn't just an intro. That was the majority of the sermon. Okay? It says, let the wise hear and increase in learning. The one who understands, obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Why is the fear of God the beginning of wisdom? It's the beginning of wisdom because wrath is real. The reason to believe God's word and obey it is because the other side of it is his wrath. What this is saying is your reason for knowing what he has said and conforming your life to it is the fact that if you don't, his wrath is on your life. Your fear of that ought to be the driver behind your life turning to him. The old turn or burn, right? Which is not a sign I would hold up at a football game, but it's not false either. Proverbs 1, 20 to 23 says, Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the market she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy street she cries out. At the entrance of the city gate she speaks. It's pretty much saying everywhere. Everywhere you turn, wisdom is crying out to be heard. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, behold... I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. You know, in Romans, it talks about from the beginning of creation, no man has had an excuse because we've always been able to see him in the creation that surrounds us. In Isaiah chapter 1, the beginning of the chapter, God is talking about the wrath he's going to pour out on the nation. He's talking about all the things they've done and turned away from him. And it's just loaded. He talks about their feasts, new moons and your appointed feast. my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I'm going to hide my eyes. Don't bring me any more offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fearless. Plead the widow's cause. One of the problems is that as human beings, we can't do any of that. We can try, we can do some good things, but we are unable to be right before him. Have you ever heard the verse, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That's Isaiah 1. That verse falls right in the middle of God telling Israel, about what's going to happen because of his wrath. 
Isn't that like one of the most incredibly compassionate verses you've ever heard? And it falls right in the middle of God talking about his wrath. That is the grand picture. Would Josiah have cried out and asked his priest to inquire of the Lord if he didn't think the Lord had any capacity to show him mercy? Probably not. It wouldn't have been worth it. Just this morning, I was listening to a snippet of uh, a sermon, and this verse was mentioned, and I have to kind of close with this verse. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him, that him is Jesus. For our sake God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The wrath of God is real. And the wrath of God is poured out on the sin of man. And this says that God literally made Jesus the object of his wrath. He made him sin who knew no sin. So that wrath that is real was paid for in the life of everyone who surrenders to him that day on the cross. Everyone who surrenders to him and accepts that gift, that wrath was paid for. For him who rejects the cross, the wrath still applies. That's the truth. So for every unfortunate soul in this world that hates God, he loves them deeply and wants to save them. But his wrath is real and it will visit them when their life is over, if not sooner. That's the truth. That's the reason we run to the word of God. Not to make our life more comfortable. To be saved from the wrath of God and flooded with his love and payment and peace and joy and purpose. We cannot forget the backside of all the wonderful things that we have when we're saved. So know that that world out there is going to suffer his wrath. That's a reason to pray that if you don't reach them, someone does. That they come across scripture, that they have an opportunity to surrender their lives to him. Okay? The Bible talks about there comes an end to his mercy. When judgment happens, it's too late to go back. So as we jump into the book of Proverbs in the next few weeks, let the reason you listen and apply it be that you want to live inside of his promise for you. And that's a heart condition. That's a heart that says, I want to love you more, I want to know you more, and I want to live my life for you. God, I know in the midst of that, that the only one who can change me and make me new is you. Right? That's why our righteousness is always in Christ. Never forget the fact that our righteousness has everything to do with our trust in him. Righteousness is his. Righteousness is only ever lent to us. So don't bank on standing next to me at judgment and cashing in on my downfalls to make you look better because that ain't going to happen. You're going to stand there on your own. And if your words are not, he bought me, there's absolutely no reason to let me in other than the fact that he paid for me and my only hope is him. That is going to be the, oh, that better be the words on your mouth if you're asked on that day because any reason in your own power is going to be a bad result. One thing you hear me say a lot of times is that I hope more and more every day the Word of God, His heart, and His plan is the priority in your life. Things just work better that way. Have a great week.